In the last video about DCV Access Console, we talked through the main features and the drivers for why folks like you might need it to manage your visualization environments, especially as they become more complex to administer because you have lots of users with different needs and so on. But today, we're going to show you how this thing works by getting Andrew to walk us through the UI and kick all the tires. Let's get busy. Andrew, we're going to start with the end user's point of view, and then we'll get into the admin console later. The end user thing should be basically a fairly should be a fairly simple demo because it's it's nice and easy for the end user to use, right? Absolutely, um, and it really just starts with this landing page uh, within the product. We do allow for custom branding, so this is the branding that you'll get out of the box. But you know, once you start to implement this within your uh, your environment, if you wanted to show specific branding to your business, uh, that's something that we allow for. What we've just landed on is this is what the end user sees. So they can see they already have an existing session within Linux. Um, if they had more sessions, they can see all of that. And when they select their session, they can expand so that they can see all the different details uh, of that session. But some days they may need this Linux host that has a high-end GPU, maybe the next day they just need a simple Windows machine or vice versa. How they can get that next uh, session is they ultimately just create this button and everything that's provided in here is what we call session templates. So last time we talked about DCV Session Manager, all of these hosts are checking in with Session Manager so it knows what it has available. And we'll, we'll show this in the admin portion of the demo, but ultimately the administrator provides session templates or what kind of machines these end user needs we already have one created for Linux, so let's go ahead and create one for Windows. And as always, you should do a display name so that they can remember what they're doing it for. And that's it. So it's going to go ahead and create their session. So when I hit create session, it just found that with one of the machines that's already checked into it. And Fantastic. we can see it right here. All of these things are just updating in real time. So, okay. And so literally we could connect to that Windows box now yeah. by doing what? So, and I'll show you two different options here. So they have a few actions that they can do, but I want to show you the easiest method first, which they just hit connect. This will automatically use our HTML5 browser viewer. So you can see I'm now connected to the instance. Uh, By the way, this blows people's mind regularly. The idea that you've got a full virtual desktop you know, HD, 4K, whatever, inside a browser tab. It's, it's wicked. Yeah, it's really cool. oh, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> and there's there's a lot of different features, especially the one that I see value with these kinds of workloads is UDP streaming. So it's going to be a little bit more smoother than a traditional like TCP WebSocket, which is what the browser uses. So ultimately, the OS native clients have additional features when compared to the web browser. Uh, ultimately, it's just because we have more control over that client. So if the end user needs some of these features, instead of just clicking connect like we did to go through the browser, they can just uh, select actions connect using, and it will pick up which client they would use on their uh, local device. For me, it's Mac OS. And if they don't have it already, um, it will prompt them to download it. I already do. So we're off to the races. So that's actually, so, so just to be really clear, this is actually using the DCV native client for, for the Mac, because you're a Mac user, very sensibly. Um, and it's and, and because it's that DCV native client, we've got control over things like what network protocol it uses to actually stream to, to the server in the cloud. And suddenly we're now, we're going to get something that's a lot more punchy and a lot more touchy-feely, right? Yeah, exactly. So, and that's what it comes down to with our, all the additional features that you can kind of get through an OS client. I always recommend to use an OS client, but a lot of customers also may use a device that is almost like a thin client or uh, a really low power device. Uh, they may want to use the browser. And if they do that, it, they can either have the experience that I just showed, or we even offer a DCV web SDK so they can customize the entire experience in the browser. Fantastic. All right. So um, show us what it looks like to actually log in on one of these things. Yeah. Show us so the when you go through, I, I, I'm going through a gateway. So when you go through a gateway, we offload authentication of the protocol to an authentication token. And that token came from the broker. Again, the end user didn't need to do any of this. It just all happened behind the scenes to securely connect me. And now that I'm here, I can send control delete because that's what Windows expects. And I can log in to the desktop with the credentials I know. So again, if I'm joined to Active Directory or some other centralized identity, that's the credentials the end user puts in. It's something they're already kind of used to doing. And if you're a business that has implemented smart cards, it's the same kind of thing. That's a feature that we provide with the clients, uh, the OS-based clients. 
you can redirect your smart card in the session and then use that to walk. All right. So, so that, okay. the, so that, that is, that is really, that's the nuts and bolts of the end user environment. How about we get into the admin environment then? So let's log out and log in as uh, an administrator and just see what different options populate. So the first thing that you'll notice is when you log in as an administrator, a lot of the options in the navigation bar on the left has have updated to show me uh, different actions I can take as an administrator. So the first thing you see is sessions, but they're no longer the sessions that are aligned to me because I'm the administrator, so I can see all of my sessions. So I had a pre-existing Linux session that was assigned a demo user. I created a new session uh, during the user demo for Windows. So I can see both of these as available and I can pop open all the information that I need to see about them uh, from like an administrator standpoint. We talked a little bit about the session templates and really what that means for an end user where they can just kind of select one and it will do the rest for them. Um, you can see these are the two that I've created and I assigned them to a specific user. And again, you can be very granular with how you assign things as an administrator. But I wanted to show you kind of what the options are when you're creating the template. So you can choose obviously Linux or Windows, but you can start to get much more specific with the operating system version. So maybe that specific end user needs this version of the OS. And right, that's one needs, the they one. must have Ubuntu 22 yeah, or exactly. they need Rocky so Linux. Got it. You can simply separate those by session templates as an administrator and then assign those to the end users that need them or are aligned to them. Um, we mentioned before about when you have a machine that multiple users can utilize the underlying resources, that's what we call a virtual session within Linux. So you can do that within this. You can say, hey, should I be able to have multiple sessions on one single machine? Or should it be just a console session mapped one to one? Um, this is all just something that you could set within the template. And then the end user, it's invisible to them. It's just they ask for their session. And all of these parameters of requirements are just automatically provided to the broker uh, when it's asked. Again, we have several other things. You can specify which region, instance type, instance ID, um, or specifically even like number of vCPUs, memory, and so on. Um, and you can even get more into it with how many you know, concurrent clients should be connected. And we, in our documentation, you can see all the requirements that we provide. We don't show them all in the UI because we want to keep it clean, but you can still use all of those requirements uh, that we have within the broker. And that's this last section. You can just manually add them. I won't go ahead and create this whole thing, but just to kind of show what the last step of this is, this is where you can assign it to specific users and groups as an administrator. Um, and that's how it populated for me when I was logged in as a user, because I simply uh, basically gave permission to that template to that specific user, but the other users wouldn't be able to see it unless I explicitly assigned it to them. What about actually managing the hosts? Because that seems like it's a, a, a clearly inside Access Console, that's a different activity. Yeah, so we have a specific tab for um, all of your hosts. I only provision two for this demo, so you can see my Windows and Linux host. If I want to see additional info on any of these, I can just pop this open, and you have all the different information that the broker knows about gets populated within the web UI or the Access Console. Mm -hmm. uh, what's really nice is the availability. So if you think about this scale to hundreds or even thousands of hosts, you can see if the server is full, meaning we've already provisioned uh, the maximum amount of sessions on that. So since I'm doing console sessions, the max is one. We place both of those so the, these servers are full. So an administrator can quickly tell which machines are taken and not taken and so on. Um, and this helps them so they can better right size their scaling, right? So these we aren't doing fleet management through this portal. The administrator is deploying these and you know standing them up, starting them would makes time uh, makes the most sense for timing with the business. So if people start at 9 a.m., they may you know power these on at 8:30 or, or what have you, and then you'll just automatically see these check into the broker, which means they check in and show within the Access Console within AWS that the administrators can use all the different optimization techniques that they're used to within EC2. So these could be auto scaling groups based off of um, an Amazon machine image that's pre-configured with everything it needs. That auto scaling group could have you know time scheduled scaling or step scaling and so on. These aren't any new uh, concepts that we're applying to DCV. And even if they're using like their own EC2 image builder pipelines, we give uh, Amazon managed components for DCV so they can just inject DCV into their existing image builder pipelines. The image is created, it scales out, and it checks into the access console. Now, cool. sometimes setting up, uh, especially if you're making a, a more scalable deployment. It can be difficult to build these architectures. So one thing that we are providing, uh, just as like a quick start, if you want to POC this, is there's two different uh, cloud developer kits. 
So if you want to deploy a CDK to get a gateway and session manager stood up, and then you want to deploy a CDK to drop in Access Console pre-configured, ready to go. So you can provision all of these architectural resources using the CDKs provided within DCV samples, within AWS samples of GitHub. Uh, we'll put the link within the description, but that gives you an easy way to deploy everything you need to quickly get started. And if you have an existing deployment, you can just use the CDK to deploy that DCV Access Console. How do we manage users? This is this is obviously pretty important. How do we actually authenticate users, manage them, and decide uh, who's going to get in? So there's really two different ways that we're authenticating users. And at the end of the day, we mentioned this uh, in the beginning of the video, but when the user logs in, those credentials are going to the underlying machine's PAM module and validating them. So that's what's called system authentication. The reason that, that that's really how we've configured this is because administrators are already used to how they manage authentication at the OS level. So it's not going to be any different for the access console. One option that's a little bit more aligned to builders that have a customized off flows, we offer uh, using headers. So you may uh, have something in front of the access console that gets like a JWT or some sort of token header. You can actually use that, redirect it into the auth server and do your own custom validation to allow users access the users will automatically populate within the console once they've successfully authenticated. So it's nothing manually they need to do. Um, alternatively, we do have an option to import users. So you can basically just take everything. If you have a big bulk group of users, put them in a CSV, upload it, and then they'll pre-populate with what kind of role, meaning a user and admin or groups and so on. And then all the information will be within the console. And that's pretty much it. It's not rocket science. If you want to get started, then the details are all here and we'll leave this link in the show notes. The documentation is actually rather awesome, but if you need to pick the team's brains, you can find them hanging out in repost, which is our AWS user forum. Andrew and his team have also put CDK templates and other goodies up on GitHub for you to swipe and to use for your own nefarious purposes. So you don't need to start anything from scratch. Stand on the shoulders of someone else. It's definitely the cloud way. Get busy.